put the customer experience first and then figure out the technology solution to that customer experience and you may not have all the solutions on day one but where you want to be with customer experience that should be very clear welcome to two sided the marketplace podcast brought to you by share tribe hello and welcome I'm Shurt, CMO at ShareTribe, and I am your host. For this episode, I'm joined by Gaurav Singhal, co-founder at DriveLock, a peer-to-peer car rental platform for Singapore and Australia. This is a bit of a first of its kind. DriveLock is the first company to appear on Two Sided that is a customer of ShareTribe, the company that sponsors this podcast and a set where I work. We have somewhat consciously tried to feature guests that are not ShareTribe customers, as I didn't want to become one of those icky self-promotional podcasts. The goal of this podcast is and always has been to provide valuable and unique knowledge to marketplace founders and operators. And so we try to prevent any suggestion of a cross-promotion or nepotism, by lack of a better word. And we do the same for our other publications as well, such as the Marketplace Academy or the Marketplace Academy podcast. And our guideline there is simply that all our content should be usable without ever even touching a shared web product. Now, of course, we strongly prefer it if you do use a shared web product, but it should be possible to take all that advice, all those experiences with you without ever doing so. But of course, guideline or no guideline, it is hard to pass on a great guest with such an inspiring story. And so that's how I ended up talking to Gaurav. DriveLa is in another one of those categories that has been around for a while peer-to-peer car rental. Over the years, we've seen Turo, Getaround, and many others working in this space already. But Drivela shows that there's still a lot of space there if you do it well. And on doing it well, Garof shared some very cool insights. I learned a lot more about them than I already knew. For example, how both founders moved from corporate jobs to founding this startup, a situation I'm sure that many people can sympathize with how they've prioritized the customer experience over everything else and still do, how they onboarded their first supply through the most basic method of marketing, namely flyering, and how they focused early on perfecting the trinity of validation, regulation, and insurance. And finally, once again, the importance of trust and how they think about trust and what they do to maintain trust throughout the platform. A super great episode, especially for peer-to-peer marketplaces, but basically for any marketplace where trust is a big ingredient. I hope you enjoy it as well. And as always, don't forget to subscribe, review, or even reach out to us on Twitter. But for now, here's my conversations with Gaurav Signal from DriveLa. Hi, Gaurav. Welcome to the show. Hi, Shwad. Thanks for having me over. Yeah, welcome. In this podcast, we always introduce a little bit who's talking so that people can put it in the right context. We're going to talk today about DriveFly, your marketplace for car rentals. But before we dive into there, can you tell us a little bit about who is Gaurav and what did you do before you started DriveFly? So my name is Gaurav Singhal, and uh, I'm the co-founder of DriveFly. And before uh, me and my co-founder started DriveFly, I was uh, in corporate jobs for the first 15 years of my life, doing various roles in marketing, sales, technology, etc. And then we came up with the idea of Trivela, me and my co-founder, Durkian. And there's been no looking back since then. What kind of corporate jobs did you do, like in a specific industry? Or is it anyhow related to Trivela, for example? Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> not at all related to Trivela. So for me, not at all related to Trivela. For my co-founder... A little bit because he was in the automotive industry for some time. And for him, it was. But largely, uh, you can say that for both the co-founders, it was not directly related to Drivela. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, walk us through your both in corporate job. So how did how did Drivela come into your life? How did you get the idea, for example, 
Yeah, so we have uh, gone through this question so many times, mostly with investors, to be very honest. And why did why did we really start, and how did we really start? You can tell us the honest version now. You don't we, you don't need any money from <laughs> yes. us. So, yeah, yeah, and if you're ready to give, um, I'm happy to take it. But uh, coming back <laughs> to answering your question, so Durkin and myself, uh, we were colleagues before we started Drive Lab. So we were colleagues in Singapore, and as colleagues, uh, you would generally. Uh, in the afternoon, you go out for lunch together, right? And, uh, you know, spend some time and discuss what's happening in your life. And it was one of these days in, in somewhere in September 2018 when we were having lunch and uh, we started discussing. And he was talking to me about his holiday in Europe, wherein he rented a car from another person. And that was we hadn't heard that before. And he's, he told me about his experience and how, you know, how this person came to pick him up from the airport. And he then dropped the person back to his house and then drove around. It was a great experience. He didn't have to stand in a queue of a car rental company. And at that point also, in the same time, I was actually planning to go from Singapore to Malaysia and rent the car. And I was actually finding it really hard to get a car for myself. So we were ex- like exchanging notes on renting a car because we started discussing his holiday. That is where it started from. And one thing led to the other. And we said, hey, possibly, you know, is this something that can work here? Because in Singapore, actually, cars are very expensive. So we said, oh, let's just find out a little bit. Huh? And that was the triggering conversation for Driver. And we have never looked back from that. Yeah. But then, you're, you know, you're at a lunch table. This is an idea. You go to another lunch. You talk some more. What made you make the decision that was like, oh, this could actually be something. At what point do you think, okay, actually, you know what? Like, well, let's take this seriously. Yeah, I think somewhere at the back of our minds, I think both for Dirk and myself, we wa- were wanting to do something of other, right? There was a shared objective of wanting to do something. We were not very explicit about it to each other, but yes, uh, we had something at the back of our mind and that is what kept us going. So, you know, it happens in a lot of conversations. You have a conversation with somebody, oh, let's do this. And the next day you forget about it. It does happen quite a lot of times, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have lots of those. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a lot of idea conversations and then you say, forget about it. But I think something triggered in that conversation and we kept following up on the things we said we'll do. So we said, okay, why don't you research X on this? Why don't you research, let's say, regulatory on this? Why don't you research how does this work in other parts of the world, right? Maybe this, because this, this concept existed at that point of time in the US and Europe. Yeah, exactly. Right. There was like Turo and all those. Get around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Those guys were there. So we said, oh, let's just split some work. And we took very smart actions. We said, okay, let's you figure this out. I'll figure this out. And let's just exchange notes tomorrow. Let's. And then we started doing some research and stuff like that. And one thing started leading to the other. And we started gathering. This was not something that we've always wanted to do. No. Actually, we started falling in love with the idea as we researched it. So that's how it was. And we just did a very good job of following up through of what we said to each other, we'll do, right? It was as simple as that. Yeah. And we started developing a passion for the whole uh, idea. And, and as I said, we have never looked back since then. Yeah. And so what's the first sort of like milestone? So, so you you do a lot of research, you, you get more and more convinced of the idea. What does the first version look like? Did you try this out fully manually? For example, some people do that, like the most basic website. Or did you, uh, because I know you're a ShareTribe customer, or was like the ShareTribe version, the very first version? Yes, the ShareTribe version was the very first version. So when we started researching this idea, of course, uh, we wanted to see how big it, how it big it can be, but and also started to look at what could be the important ingredients of the of getting to the market. Because one thing I think we understood pretty early that we have to test it out as soon as we can, right? Before, let's say, putting everything behind it. And then realizing oh, it could work or could not work. How can we test it out so quickly? So we spoke to many people. Okay. Actually. Yeah. Could you tell a little bit about actually about that process? Because I think that like that's something also we try to instill always to people that like you can do a lot of validation before putting any product in the market. So, so did you have some kind of process for that or did you just randomly talk to people? There was a so called a process behind it. But uh, what we did very deliberately was to have conversations with people, right? Of, okay. People who don't have cars, okay, what, are you, what do you do? I mean, uh, would you like to rent out your car if you would ask to, right? And we actually also sent out, we made a survey on one of those free survey sites, right? We didn't want to spend money on stating a survey, so we sent a money, so something on a free survey site. And we just sent it out to people we know, 
and we ask them to send it out to people they know and so let's say we send it out to somebody we call them hey you've received something can you send it to all the whatsapp groups you are in and we actually receive hundreds of replies actually on that sir wow wow yeah. so we what we realized is and these were genuine uh, responses it was not bot responses right so as a result what happened is that we we realized that there are many people who were pretty interested in let's say sharing their car if they had the right insurance cover for example right that was one of the things they were they were if and if they were told that you know and one of the questions was i still remember that if we were to uh, ensure you of the insurance would you rent your car out and a majority of people said yes and we's like hey that's great and hence initial validation sort of of the idea happened through that survey and those conversations that was one big thing plus then there were other ingredients to answer your question on the milestone we had to check on the regulatory aspect because you have individual people sharing their cars so regulation regulatory aspect becomes important because in most of the markets around the world you can share your car to with other people but in singapore had a very specific law which prohibited this from happening right so uh, that was a big roadblock for us to overcome and then the other roadblock was insurance because if you are renting out your car to other people i cannot use your insurance because your insurance won't cover it so we had to come up with insurance solution where within the time for it is rented out it's insured by somebody else so we had actually we had valid so just to sum up three points validation yes uh, we kind of managed to do that initially and get some positive response regulatory big challenge insurance big challenge and that then that became our focus on insurance and regulatory to fix before we go live Yeah, can you tell a little like well, actually I'd be interested to hearing in both. Like did the regulation change? Did you find a loophole? How did that work? We didn't find a loophole. So what happened is that and this is what both Dirk and I believe in is that, you know, you just have to keep hustling, right? You have to keep hustling. So if I talk about insurance, we actually knocked on the doors of 20 different insurance providers in Singapore before we could crack the 21st. Right? it took us a lot of effort to get an insurance provider on board because insurance providers are used to providing insurance on a annual basis not on a trip based basis exactly. so he, nobody is going to give you insurance for 3 hours for driving a mercedes right nobody so it became it was very challenging that time. but we managed to you know get an insurance partner on board at that point the reason why i'm interested in this because we have an earlier episode this season with Dirk Fazer from Paul Camper which was a, a camper van rental thing and and he also mentioned that i think he spent like 3 years or something maybe i'm exaggerating i don't recall exactly but an incredibly long time to get an insurance product into the market that is exactly like what you are saying so did you find some smaller company or how, how did that work out so we actually spent around 6 to 7 months actually to figure out an insurance partner and knocking on their doors getting repeatedly rejected repeatedly i think because so we used to getting rejected by insurance companies but we just kept on it and we of course had a plan b on insurance but that would have been a very uh, suboptimal solution but thankfully we were we managed to get an insurance partner on board we started with an insurance partner whose name is Tokyo Marine and they are pretty well established around the world and uh, they were they were excited by our idea and they are still our insurance partners in singapore and uh, that was on insurance coming back to regulatory uh, regulatory we have a very, very interesting story so as i said the regulation didn't permit us to do this model right so both dirk and myself we were we were we had started going to some of these startup festivals or startup shows or startup events and you know and once you start getting into that mode you want to meet people and you know and get a grasp of um, you know what's really happening out there and we went to this one of these events for national university of singapore nus they have a show called unicorn or something i don't i'm forgetting the name we were uh, listening to uh, one of the ministers uh, from the singapore government who was talking who was the guests and was presenting how singapore government is supporting startups and he was just encouraging people to do, think out of the box and you know saying singapore government is with them and and stuff like that and we were very and he, he said hey that that's what we need right so we got his name and of course we couldn't speak to him that time but we wrote an email to his office explaining the situation right and the minister was so kind enough to respond to our email right and he asked one of his ministerial members to look into our case right and then we presented the idea to them right and 
Of course, as I'm speaking, it just sounds that one thing happened after the other, but certainly it did not. I mean, it took some time. It took a lot of effort. and But they were open to the idea because Singapore ultimately, as a country they and as a, as a government, they want to, to be car light. And our business model is completely aligned to that idea of the city. And not just in Singapore, but now in Australia also, right? What we are trying to do is to make cities car light. So they understood the idea, they appreciated the idea, and they built a sandbox for us. They built a sandbox for us in which we could, and we got the approval to run the sandbox in Singapore with uh, some set number of cars. But that, and then, you know, we worked with so closely with uh, them, with the Land Transport Authority in Singapore and Ministry of Trade and Industry. And we shared data with them in terms of how are, how people are adopt- adapting to this, adopting this platform. Right, and then taking this up, and it has been a wonderful association, uh, and a lot of lot lot of support because it ultimately, and the reason it works is because the objective is aligned. Ultimately, right? That, that that's where it works. So, regulatory was a challenge, but not so in Australia because you're allowed to share your cars. So, and we also had some learning from Singapore, so it was a little easier when it comes to regulatory anything. Sure. Yeah, a wonderful story. That's nice that you're like, you could, because it, I think many, many governments, or at least in my experience, also, they like the idea of being associated with startups and being innovative. But it's nice to sort of like catch them into saying this and then be like, hey, how about this actually? Like, how about you live up to the word? Yeah. Did help us uh, in terms of building a sandbox and bringing this idea to this level. Yeah, totally. If that roadblock wouldn't have been removed, it would be a whole different story, right? Like basically, you're you're doing something illegal. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's terrific. Yeah. And then the first version is the sandbox. So then you had a running application already for Drivela when you ran that. Yeah. So when we and of course the three points that I said, right? Validation of the idea, uh, regulatory and insurance, and the fourth point, of course, was building the product itself. At that time, we were contemplating whether to take an off-the-shelf solution to start with, quickly test it, and then see what we need to build or to build it from scratch. I think at that point of time, late 2018, the concept of SaaS-based marketplaces was just starting out, right? So there were not a lot of proven solutions out there. So we were in parallel talking to a few developers because both Dirk and myself, we're not you know, hardcore tech people, and you needed somebody who could uh, build the product for you. And that's how we came across ShareDrive at that point of time, right? And I remember you guys had just launched, I think, beta testing of product ShareDrive Flex, right? Okay, yeah, 2018. I think it was really new. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you had a product called ShareDrive Go. We actually registered on that product, but it was not sufficient for us. So we actually, and Flex was not available in Singapore. So I literally had to reach out to Juho and plead with him to get ShareDrive Flex live in Singapore. Oh, yeah, (laughs) yeah. True, yeah. Was it? I guess this was because of Stripe, right? So I guess there was some Stripe regulation. Yeah, this was because of Stripe. This was because of Stripe regulations. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we literally had to work around it to get ShareDrive Flex working in Singapore. And I think we were one of the very first customers on ShareDrive Flex at that point. Then we got a bunch of developers uh, through an agency on board to help us customize it for our requirements do the basic customizations and go to the market ASAP because that was really the idea to go to the market as soon as we can. What other considerations did you have? Like just uh, not even just chair trap, but more like when you think about making the decision between coding from scratch or taking off the shelf, like what do you consider besides speed, obviously? but Yeah, I think that time, yeah, speed, very key consideration, very key consideration. I don't think at that point we were also in thinking of how we will scale this up. Right, because that is not the concern. Because you start with doing things which may or may not scale. Even today, we do things which may or may not scale. But first, you see how it works, and then you worry about scaling. Right, and that's at least that's been our learning in the last uh, couple of years. Figure it out, try it out, and then worry about scaling. Don't worry about scaling without trying it out. I think predominantly it was speed, right, and uh, so that you know we can get out in the market and see how it works how people respond to it. And that was primarily the deciding factor for us. Because if had we started doing it from scratch, it would have taken us a longer time, right? And uh, a lot more iterations would have been needed. Yeah, that's, I mean, like, obviously, like, <laughs> I mean, this is not a podcast advertising share drive usually, but like, I'm glad that that's, the, because that's also our assumption always, that like, the, or like, that's the value that we think we bring, like, just 
road to market should be fast as possible just to validate and not lose any time and, and money in the process. So, you you know, coming back to the survey, so you had already some like some hundreds of people being aware of DriveLock. How did you onboard the first users, like both supply and, and demand side? So first of all, I do at that point, when we reached out to people for the survey, we did not even mention DriveLock. It was an unbranded survey just to check people for their senses on the idea. I think one thing we understood pretty early is that your supply has to come in first, right, before demand. Because technically speaking, demand exists already. Whether it's car sharing or car rentals, which has a huge overlap, there is a demand that exists. The point is, where do you get supply? And we had to think about how to convince people to share a very prized asset, such as a car in Singapore. Singapore is one of the most expensive countries in the world to own a car. And to ask a person who has spent $100,000 on a car to share his car with a, with a stranger was slightly a challenging thought in itself. And when we spoke to people, I said, many people said, yeah, nobody's going to do this in Singapore yeah, because the cars are too dear to them. Yeah. And it was definitely a worrying factor. But we had also spoken to many people who, because cars are so expensive, the cost of owning a car is on a monthly basis is very high. And hence, people are looking at ways to reduce their cost at the same time, right? Yeah, and it's like usually like fastly depreciating in value also, right? It is fastly depreciating in value. If you have the, the installments that you have to pay for your loan that you've taken on your car, you have to pay for, you, you, there's a depreciation element. There is a road tax, there is insurance, there is maintenance, there is there, yeah, there's parking, there's few. I mean, you're just spending a lot of money, even if you're using it only 5% of the time. So our goal was very clear. We had to get supply on board. Right? So supply on board can only happen once insurance is closed. So we first closed our insurance, right? The regulatory piece, and then you know, we, of course, in parallel, we also talking started talking to people uh, with cars, people who we know have cars. But the defining exercise for us for getting supply on board was flyering on cars. Okay. So we created flyers and put it on the windshield of cars. We couldn't afford manpower, so we had to do it ourselves. Yeah, oh, that's terrific. It reminds me, uh, last season, we had this great episode of uh, Green Pal with, uh, I, think the, I think the CEO was called Brian. It, it was a like landscaping service, a lawnmower service. And he also said that he and his co-founder, I think, like, distributed like a hundred thousand like door hangers you know like those things just like in hotel rooms that you can like hey that's something like a hundred thousand door hangers in one city how did you choose your locality i mean like how did you choose where to put them i mean singapore is a pretty big city we were always carrying set of flyers with us wherever we were going we're just carrying and flying it the other thing bit is that you know if you're going to a shopping mall there are hundreds of cars standing in the basement just go and put it in the basement. If you're passing a big building, uh, big housing, big apartment, and you just go down and, you know, sometimes the, the security guard will come and, you know, ask you to leave and then you politely leave, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then you go to the next one till the time the security guard comes chasing you, right? So, yeah, that's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that, yeah. Because we didn't have money to actually spend on digital marketing at that point because it had not even, not even live. But we started generating some interest, people, and we had to actually, we had to literally stop people in when they were parking their car, stop them, talk to them, explain them the concept. Sometimes people would sign up. Most of the times they won't, right? So you have to get on with it and ensure that don't get demotivated by it. And we kept on doing it, kept on doing it. And when we had our first few cars, let's say first 20, 30 cars when we had, we had listed on the platform. But even when you've listed them, does not mean that they will rent out their cars. And there is no guarantee of that. Yeah. So that is what we did. And uh, so flying, I think uh, that is something that was very crucial for us to get our initial supply. Very, very initial supply. And then uh, the first people renting, how did you get those on board? The first trip that we had was on uh, Durkian's car. <laughs> His neighbor <laughs> wanted to go to Kuala Lumpur and he was looking for a rental car. And we just, uh, asked, <laughs> he just asked him to rent the car, rent his car. Uh, on the plan. We also wanted to see how the transaction works and everything works because a lot of things were assumptions, right? Uh, you know, how will the pickup process work? How will the drop off process work? The guy takes his pictures and all of that. So we are, what if the car breaks down and, you know, there are a lot of ifs and buts, and we have never seen that before. Now we do hundreds of trips, so 
yeah, we've gotten used to it. But that was a first trip, very scary. So yeah, the neighbor, his neighbor rented his car and uh, took it to KL and uh, <laughs> brought it back in one piece, thankfully. So that was a good experience. And uh, yeah, then we had some friends, uh, family, you know, share renting cars uh, initially. Yeah, and the friends uh, renting cars from each other, from from us, and all of that. So I think that that sort of caught the ball a little rolling. Right. One of the things that really helped us at that point of time was when our the whole the concept uh, came to public's attention, to a large public attention, because of our the kind of press coverage we got at that time, because we were in a sandbox and that was by the government, so it got picked up by some of the leading publications in Singapore because of the uniqueness of the idea, right? And they thought, oh, yeah, the government is supporting uh, new startups and uh, which are doing innovative stuff. So it got picked up. And once that came out uh, in the press, then the initial traction that we got of few first few trips, then it started quickly multiplying, right? People started coming to us and uh, trying to understand, uh, you know, uh, how this works because there was a lot of explaining needed in the in the beginning on how this whole thing works, both for car owners and renters. So hence, your customer support has to be great. So we were the customer support ourselves. So I remember taking you know, answering phone calls uh, of customers, responding to them on chat all the time and saying, oh, this is how this works. Let me give you a call. Let me come and meet you. Those kind of things. So we met a lot of our customers ourselves, right, initially. So had you at that point already sort of committed and like quit your job and went full in on this? Or did you still do this as a sort of side hustle <laughs> like on the one yeah so uh, in terms of uh, quitting our uh, corporate jobs uh, Dirk can quit his job first followed by myself some of the things so of course initially you do parallelly to understand and test the idea but as soon as we started getting into it fully Dirk can quit his job then i quit my job and then there was no looking back and then uh, because like coming back to the uh, pr thing or the press thing of course like that really that also really released one of the other big things here. And that's actually what's going to be my, one of my questions is like trust, right? Like, can we trust this company? And of course, like once it's been in the press, like this combination of press and government support, I guess, alleviated a lot of the trust issues. What other things did you do initially? And of course, any insurance, let's not forget that. Did you do anything other special to really increase the trust to both sides? I think one of the elements that really worked for us is that we met our customers very often, especially the supply side, because the trust issue did not get alleviated because we were just appeared in press. Yes, of course, it helps the trust factor. It's just definitely having the insur- having the right insurance partner, having the backing of the transport authority. Yes, it just help- does definitely helps trust. But people still want to see and meet people who are doing this, who are behind this. So we met a lot of our hosts, as we call them, people who share their car, we call them hosts. We met a lot of them personally and we we had coffees with them we had beer with them and you know we just to you know just understand explain the concept and push them to come up out there right because there are a certain set of people who are experimentative in nature right always and there's some people who will follow follow the others yeah <laughs> some people did uh, wanted to uh, really test this out and yeah and then um, we managed to convince some of them but i think the trust element is critical in a sharing economy marketplace like this one especially when you have an asset which is so expensive and everything you do right from the way your customer support talks and responds to a question the way you answer on your website the way you make your payouts to people after a transaction is over, all of these are indicators of trust ultimately. And they play their own role in building trust. So for example, if you a trip is completed and if you don't pay out on time, in the committed time, then it also erodes trust. So there are very, I don't think it's just about one single factor impacting trust. There are a lot of small, small things which lead up to building trust. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. So we've talked about like the first couple of transactions, friends and family, and then the next wave because of the the press coverage. You grew uh, rather fast, actually. And, and now if even we can talk a little bit later, I'd like I'd love to talk about the expansion to Australia. But how do you, you know, like a wave of press mentions is not a sort of sustainable growth strategy. So what has worked for you to sort of keep that growth up? I think a couple of things. So at some point in time, of course, we, uh, after the initial traction, we started looking for investors 
to pump put money into our business so we did a seed round for some seven hundred thousand dollars so actually even before the seed round both Durkin and myself we put in our own money into the business to get the basics started for the platform little bit of digital marketing a little bit of facebook little bit of google here and there get that bold bold holding so get some also move beyond organic reach to get some paid reach out there right and uh, once we started once we got our seed investment for seven hundred thousand dollars we started pushing the pedal on marketing but guess what then we raised our investment in february 2020 right and uh, march 2020 COVID hit and uh, i remember us sitting with uh, one of our investors in february in the shambhila hotel in singapore and we were just discussing oh, how bad can COVID be yeah? how bad oh maybe three months four months five months yeah big deal yeah and uh, it just beat all our expectations right at that point of time so everything shut down in singapore april 2000 everything shut down in singapore but one of the things that we realized is that people still had mobility need for mobility need and they were avoiding taxis and public transport at that time so they wanted cars so actually what happened for us is that i would say it was sort of a tailwind for us at that point of time the whole covid thing that people wanted to you know rent cars which were personally owned rather than taking a cab or taxi which has been exposed to 10 people already because initially people were very hyper they didn't know what was happening with covid so everybody wanted to be extra careful right and so we actually and this came out after speaking to a few customers and they said yeah i just rented the car because i thought yeah i didn't want to take the risk of taking a cab or something. and hence i rented a car and we said oh that's great so we built a campaign around it we built a campaign of clean car safe car kind of a thing we built a campaign and we did a lot of social media posting sharing on whatsapp groups and blah 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 we did a lot of that at that time and uh, of course it picked up right and uh, people uh, did understand uh, you know yeah it was safer we also started actually distributing disinfectant kits to our car owners <laughs> so that they could disinfect their cars and i started telling people oh this car has been disinfected this car has not been disinfected so you actually we can started doing that it was not very scalable to distribute disinfectants but again the whole point is that given it's a community based model both sides take extra care by default right so the hosts take extra care of cleaning the car by themselves i don't have to tell them they do it themselves even the guests take care of the cleanliness and ensure that they wear a mask while in the car and all of that they were doing it by themselves so it is just if it's a trust build business model already and hence a lot of these things happen by default right if you have the rights yeah and that helped us and of course then we started um, we started investing into our business but i think one of the key factors that helped our growth is the way we run our business we run our business purely on numbers so i'll give you one example so when we started if 10 people want a car so only 25% people were successful in getting a car very initial so only one fourth of people were getting a car rest three fourths of people were not getting a car even if they wanted because either the host was rejecting the booking or they just didn't respond right so we were actually we were perplexed because no matter how much you put on top of the funnel if the success rate is only 25% then there's a lot of leakage in the funnel so hence we sat down and said okay what do we need to do to reduce the leakage in this funnel right and we ran and one of the thing that we really believe in in this company and it is almost embedded in our culture and a way of working is regular testing continuous testing so we actually experimented a lot on reducing the leakage on our funnel from the time people may try come to search for a car to the time they exit while making a booking how can we improve these conversions so we focused a lot on that and then, and we now have brought in that 25% to very high 90s oh wow so fill to search ratio is 90% kind of like pretty much no if you want a car on driveway you will get one there's a 95% plus chance that you will get it that's incredible that's incredible yeah, so yeah. But, and and it is the and the reason for that is that we have worked consistently and it of course didn't happen overnight we had to run a lot of experiments we had to uh, you know many things didn't work many things failed but some things worked and you just need one or two winners to get that going right 
Could you share some of these winners? <laughs> so, of course, I would not be able to get into too many, too many, or too much of a secret sauce. Yes, <laughs> but uh, the answer lies in uh, the answer we have figured out, and of course, we're still figuring out lies in uh, looking at data very, very deeply all the time because it has to be data driven, not gut driven, right? So, if we looked at okay, why are these three fourth people not getting cars? What is the reason? And you know, okay, if the if the if the car owners are not responding, why are they not responding? So go and speak to these car owners who are not responding. Oh, you know what? I forgot to update my calendar. You know, sure. How can we help you improve your calendar? So those are some of the experiments we ran. Of course, plenty of them, and we still keep running a lot of these experiments. But uh, yeah, that uh, is something to answer your question on our growth uh, is the way we have. Uh, I think now also in Australia, the way we run our business, which is about purely metrics driven and a lot of testing about. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, like that percentage is, is, is quite incredible. And then on the topic of growth, now that you mentioned it, they also mentioned Australia. So could you tell us a little bit about the um, your growth story? So you start Singapore, Sandbox, then what? And now we are like several years later and you're in Australia. Could you tell us a little bit about how that went? Of course, uh, Singapore is uh, 6 million people huh, only as a population. So, and 500,000 cars. So there's only so much you can grow from a business point of view. Of course, there's still a lot to grow. But for us to be the biggest car sharing platform in Asia Pacific, we knew we had to go out of Singapore and crack the bigger markets. However, one of the key aspects of this platform, as you mentioned earlier, is trust. Right. So you have to find that sweet spot of markets wherein you know that there, by default, there is some trust in that market for this kind of a model to flourish and the market is big enough. And we realize that Australia takes those boxes. Right. And that's why uh, we decided to launch in Australia. We had the product ready already in Singapore. Of course, we had to do some minor tweaks. We had to figure out insurance. As I said already, regulatory was not the challenge, but we worked very closely with uh, some of the state governments in Australia too. Because again, as I said, the objective is aligned. Make it car light. And our objective is also the same. Okay. Yeah. And then did you get another round of investments for Australia? Or did you finance that from the profits? Yeah, no. So... As I said, we did a seed round in uh, early 2020, right? And then uh, we did our pre-series A last year, after which we decided to launch in Australia because one of the reasons for doing that round was uh, to start funding our expansion. So we did that. And uh, yeah, that's that's where we are now. And now we are looking at expanding into more markets. Yeah. Were you the first one to try this in Singapore? Of course, there was the regulatory blocker, but had there been other people trying this? Yeah. So uh, a few years before, I think in 2014 or 13, there was uh, there were some people who were trying this kind of business model in Singapore. did not work at that point of time. Maybe it was a little ahead of its time because what has happened in the late latter part of last decade is that business models like Uber and Grab have sort of opened the concept of the sharing economy. So people are more accepting to the whole concept of sharing somebody's asset or a car or a home, something like that, right? Maybe that time it was too much ahead of its time. Maybe that's why it didn't work. Yeah, because it's also a timing thing. Ultimately, as we all know, right, Absolutely. It, the timing yeah, yeah. is also very yeah, important. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can have the best of ideas, best of executions, but if the timing is not right, timing is not right. So, <laughs> yeah. And then in, in, in Australia, like, um, how do you, because, uh, you know, like Singapore, nicely, you know, sort of like a city state, right? Like you don't really need to choose like a city because the country is a city pretty much. How are you doing expansion in Australia? Do you go to city by city like how because like you have this local aspect how, how are you doing that this is ours is a very hyper local business ultimately because you will not you always want a car in our business which is your neighbor's car that's what you want that is the experience that you want to deliver to customers that's what we live by by ensuring that there are enough cars around people who are searching cars right if you have to travel 10 kilometers to get a car you would do that right so that is the premise of this model and hence because of that we literally treat Australia as, you know, being in five Singapores because it's, and hence it's a very city-based and not even city-based. It's a, within the city, it's a very cluster-based approach, 
right? So in Australia, we have started with three cities. We actually started with Sydney only. Then, you know, we looked at Melbourne, then added Brisbane. And right now we're focused on being focusing on these markets. We'll expand to other markets as well. But even within these cities, we're looking at clusters because that is what matters ultimately. It is not, it is, as I said, it's a hyper-local business. And uh, if I don't have supply in a cluster, and there's no no demand, huh? Yeah. So you have, there's no there's product. No, there's yeah, no product, yeah. literally. So <laughs> you got to ensure that you have a, your business approach. Your approach to scaling up is in line with the needs of uh, the customers who pay you money, which is very local. Yeah. And are there any uh, question like about the sort of differences? So you you mentioned like you had to do some tweaks to the to the product. Are there any other tweaks you needed to make? Right, like you changed the name. It's it's Drive Made in Australia, not Drive La. Like, are there any other sort of cultural differences that are maybe cool to mention? Yeah. So so before I answer that, there is of course interesting discussions we had on Drive La and Drive Made because you know as any marketer would tell you. That even if you enter different countries, yeah, keep the brand name the same because it is it is easier to scale up and all of that. Yes, sure, that is true. But Australia as a market is very proud of of whatever is Australian, right? And and bringing a foreign name like Drive Love, which is very uniquely Singaporean, we were not sure how much it is going to ring a bell, right? And hence we decided to keep it very local and nothing can be as more local than mate in australia so and that's why it's called dry mate uh, and um, uh, and uh, we are very thankful for the support we have received in uh, for dry mate in, in australia and uh, yeah that is the one change that we had to do the other ones some of the minor tweaks uh, i think from an operational point of view because operationally these markets are different right uh, because of uh, let's say uh, the distances are much long much much bigger, right? Much longer distances. And, sure. yeah, uh, that's true, yeah. you know, in Singapore, you know, within 30, 40 kilometers, you finish the country, right? Uh, but uh, uh, I think in, in Melbourne, I have to, let's say, if I drive 30 kilometers, then I reach my supermarket, right? So <laughs> uh, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but yeah, you know what I mean, right? So uh, the, the kind of operational challenges that you face are different in with both the markets. So operationally, we had to tweak ourselves definitely in australia and we're still tweaking ourselves it's not that we know everything it's a still a learning process for us yeah two sort of last questions first one like so what's next like are you expanding to other cities in australia or are you already eyeing different country markets we are already looking at uh, different countries uh, so australia yes so we are uh, we're building our business in these cities and also looking at different cities other cities in australia but more importantly we're looking next year at more markets that we can expand to in asia right and uh, some of that work has already started hopefully by early next year you will see us in at least one more market and uh, followed by a few more markets by the end of the end of next year all right that is ambitious hey so you come a long way from you know having a, at the lunch table some talks and now maybe multiple countries in one year this is a podcast aimed at the you know, aspiring marketplace entrepreneurs and, and marketplace entrepreneurs. If there's one thing you would have done differently, if there's one lesson sort of like to you, it's like, oh, I, I wish someone would have told me this at the lunch table. What would that be? Yes, there are plenty of things I can think of that, you know, I wish I had known, right? Uh, because a lot of things we have we have learned, uh, Dr. and myself, we have learned over the last few years doing things, right? And had you known that, you know, this is the right way of doing it and this is not the right way of doing it, we would have definitely used that. But I think ultimately what we, I wish we had known this from the very beginning and done this a lot better than what we did at that point of time. But now we very clearly do is that putting the, and I, this might sound very generic, but it is so important that we feel is putting the customer experience first and then figure out the technology solution. Right. But sometimes what happens is that you are living with so many constraints, right? That you use the technology constraint to deliver something to the customer without thinking about the customer experience fully. You kind of place the priority on the technology ability versus the customer experience, right? And that is where, you know, you could do things a little, we could have done, you know, I wish we, you know, we knew that at that point of time to sort of put higher priority in the customer experience first. We, of course, learn as we go along, right? So if 
you know, put the customer experience first and then figure out the technology solution to that customer experience. And you may not have all the solutions on day one, but where you want to be with customer experience, that should be very clear. Right. That is something that I, I would say that we have come a long way from there, from where we were initially to the way we do things right now. Yeah. Now that's a terrific answer. I think, well, generic, I don't think so. Like, I think we see also at ShareGrab, I see a lot of people, they are so focusing on the thing that they're building and without even talking to customers. So I think it's, you know, you people cannot be reminded of this enough. Hey, I've already taken up uh, too much of your time. Thanks a lot, uh, Graf, for all of the amazing stories and great insights into how uh, DriveLaw grew to where it is now. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Joab. Thanks for having me over. Thank you for listening to Two Sided, the Marketplace podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe. If you listen on iTunes, we'd also love for you to rate and give us a review. If you got inspired to build your own marketplace, go visit www.sharetribe.com. It's the fastest way to build a successful online marketplace business. Until next time.